Well, let's get into the passage. You know, in thinking of a text, it's always very difficult. And, um, you know, it's my, I think since 2012 or 2013, I've been doing, I've been preaching every, every Good Friday and every Resurrection Sunday. So it does get a little bit uh, more difficult. However, thankfully, we have the Holy Spirit. You know, can, and when you are sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, it's just a glorious thing to see what God has, what God lays on my heart. And so in thinking about my text for today, there are a number of factors. One, um, I think just for continuity's sake, in the sense that we spoke on John chapter 19 on, on Good Friday, it is finished. Um, so it's, it's nice to carry on still in the Gospel of John into chapter 20. And then what struck me in this passage was, was the, the amount of references to the word weeping. Did you see that? Weeping, wept, weepest. At least four times. And if you look at our bulletin, there have been lots of tears that have been shed in recent months and especially in recent days. And this passage focuses on a lady called Mary Magdalene. And if you look in the bulletin, I couldn't help but note, I just underlined, you know, it's Sister Avril, Auntie Gail, Charlotte Crowder, Deirdre Pond, Sister Veronica, Sister Stella, Dr. Cindy, Professor Dilly, all women. I don't believe in coincidences, but it's just, again, the way the Holy Spirit may have led me. Most sermons today will obviously center around the empty tomb, and rightfully so. But I would like to focus on this lady, Mary Magdalene, who sat outside the empty tomb and weeping. So let's start from where we left off on Good Friday. Remember, once Jesus was pronounced, Dead, he said, it is finished. And then he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. That was the final saying, saying number seven. Joseph of Arimathea then asked Pilate for permission to take down the body of Jesus for burial. You can look at me, I'm just giving an overview. That's John chapter 19 to the end of the passage from about 32, verse 32, 33 onwards. Do you remember that? And who was there with Joseph of Arimathea? Nicodemus. Nicodemus, and he brought along a mixture of myrrh. Do you know what says myrrh? Myrrh is the ingredient that they use in anointing oil. Myrrh and aloe. Aloe vera. The Bible says, just look there in verse 39, 39 of chapter 19. And there came also Nicodemus, which at first came to, remember, John chapter 3, which came to Jesus by night. He brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. It's about 45 kilos of aloe and myrrh. Him and Shani would have been good friends. Shani would have had him on speed dial. Nico, ice. Ice Nico, Nico D. You know, the other day, Shani had a bit of an allergy, and I bought the best medication that Discovery Comprehensive will pay for. And I brought it home. And the next thing Shani says, can you please ask Harold, my neighbor, if he's got fresh aloe? That's how humiliating it has become. But here's Nicodemus with 45 kilograms of aloe vera and myrrh. And so after Joseph of Arimathea takes down the body, the two of them lovingly and painstakingly wrap and bathe Jesus' body in the linen clothes together with the spices. And then they lay Jesus' body in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, in his own tomb. That's the Friday. On the Saturday, the Bible says in Matthew 27, the next day the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate, and they requested of Pilate that the Romans guard the tomb of Jesus so his disciples, listen, so his disciples could not steal the body. See, at that time, the religious leaders, they just had that feeling. They assumed that now they had defeated Jesus. However, they were about to learn of an incredible event and an event that would change the world. You see, because on Saturday, Jesus of Nazareth was dead, but he was not going to stay dead in that borrowed tomb. And that brings us to our text this morning, the resurrection of Jesus as told by the Apostle John, but through the eyes of a woman called Mary Magdalene. 
So point number one, I've got all your points there. I'm on a mission here. I've got two services, and these phones here are, the batteries are getting, uh, the batteries can go flat, so I don't want to go flat in the middle of my message. Eh? By the way, if any of you have a nice Samsung at home, eh? and you know you have all these contracts, if you nice top-of-the-range contract, you know, and you have an old phone with a nice camera, please donate it to the church. As you can see, that's an old, that's a very old one there, right? And this is not so bad, but batteries go flat. Now you can see that one's on charge now. Eh? So Ashley will give me the single signal just now. <laughs> batteries flat. So let's get in. Point number one, Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb. Right? Verse 1 of John chapter 20. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulchre and seeth the stone taken taken away from the sepulchre. When did Jesus rise from the dead? On the first day of the week. Did you see that? On the first day of the week. When is the first day of the week? Sunday. If you are walking around the calendar, if you've got a big calendar at home, you know the dry cleaners love to give calendars. If the first day of the week is on a Monday, tear up that calendar. The first day of the week is on a Sunday. And when do we worship? On Sunday, the first day of the week. And so it's early Sunday morning. It is still dark. And Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb. So who is Mary Magdalene? Do you remember her? She is one of at least five different women in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, named Mary. But we meet her in Luke chapter 8. Just put a note in your margin. You can go and see. Go home, be a good Berean. Search the scriptures to see if it was so. Luke 8 verse 1. It came to pass afterward that he went, that's Jesus throughout every city and village, preaching, showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. And certain women, verse 2, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. Women were full of devils those days. And he mentions the verse 3, And Johanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod, Steward, and Suzanne, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. So, Mary Magdalene is from a place called Magdala in Galilee. She was demon-possessed, but had been gloriously delivered from her demons by Jesus. Ask Carlo and Garth and Boshi. They have lots of experience in delivering. That was also a lady eh, who was demon-possessed. As a result, she and a few other women, having been delivered by Jesus, then followed Jesus from village to village. They served him. They provided financial support for Jesus and the disciples. Couldn't help but think that song. Her motto was, love him, love him, I love him, I love him. And where he goes, I'll follow, I'll follow, I'll follow. I'll follow him wherever he may go. There isn't an ocean too deep, a mountain so high that can keep me away. They were forgiven much and they loved much. They gave much. And followed Jesus they did. Remember uh, who, read the, who read Craig on, on Friday? When Jesus hung on the cross, she was there. Look at verse 25 of, verse nine, of chapter 19. Now there stood by the cross Jesus, his mother Mary, his mother's sister, and who? Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus was on the cross, she was there. When Jesus died and Joseph of Arimathea took down his body, she was there. When they placed Jesus' body in the borrow team, I believe she was there. And when she saw everything was done so hurriedly, because Jesus had to be buried quickly, she brought her own spices the next morning, decided that she would get up early on Sunday morning, come to the tomb, and finish anointing and wrapping the body of Jesus. And so from being the last person at Golgotha, she was the first person at the grave. That's called devotion. And this is how she ends up here on Resurrection Sunday morning, except... The last thing she expects to find is what? An empty tomb. What is the sight that confronts her? The Bible says, She came, she seeth the stone taketh away, taken away from the sepulchre. She sees the stone rolled away and immediately, unfortunately, like many women, jump, jump to the wrong conclusion that somebody had broken into the tomb and stolen Jesus' body. She doesn't even for one moment think that perhaps Jesus is alive and had risen from the grave. So what does she do? Verse 2, she runneth 
and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Who's that? John. Remember, John doesn't mention his name. He's the author of this gospel. And saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Point number two, she comes to, she comes to Peter and John and claims Jesus' body has been, has been stolen. Don't miss something beautiful here. Did you pick that up? Remember, just four days prior to this, what had happened? Peter had denied Jesus three times. No doubt some of the other, other disciples probably ridiculed Peter, ostracized him, maybe even rejected him, maybe even threw him out. But here we see John, the beloved apostle, taking Peter in and saying, you come with me, I'm going to support you. And hence, Mary Magdalene finds them together. She doesn't tell them what she saw, the stone rolled away. She tells them what she thinks probably happened, that someone had broken in and stolen the body of Jesus. She claimed the body had been stolen. So how do these two disciples react? They race to the tomb. John, who is younger, gets there first. He looks in. He sees the grave clothes, but it doesn't enter. Peter arriving second, and just like Peter, impulsive, barges straight in. Sees the linen clothes there, as well as the head cloth, the head napkin laying there. And the Bible says there in verse 7, not lying with clothes, the head the napkin that was around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Now, what's the significance of this? And you see all this Facebook, why is the head napkin separate and stuff? But basically what it's saying to us, the body of Jesus could not be stolen. Who's going to steal a body and still take it all the time to wrap, unwrap the cloth, leave it there, fold it nicely? What this is showing is that the body of Jesus moved through the clothes leaving them neatly folded behind. In other words, the Lord's departure was ordered, unhurried. And what it tells me is that Jesus had to be alive because only a living person has no need for burial clothes. Hallelujah, he's alive. Verse 8. Then went in also that other disciple. Now John decides to go in, which came first to the sepulcher. And look, don't miss the last few words of verse 8. And he saw, and what happened? He believed. For John, all this was enough. He needed no further proof, no further convincing to him. Just seeing the grave clothes lying there neatly folded, he knew in his heart of hearts that Jesus was alive. The, word, the Greek word therefore saw means to perceive. He understood the significance of seeing the folded grave clothes. And he Believe. What did he perceive? He perceived that the stone was rolled away not to let Jesus out, but to let them in so that they could see his body. And he, therefore he understood that Jesus was risen from the dead and Jesus was alive. Look at verse 9, back to prophecy. For as yet huh, they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. How sad. The two of them at least should have known immediately that when that tomb was empty, Jesus was alive. They did not even have to go in to see the grave clothes. Why? Jesus had told them. Matthew 16, 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and then what? And be raised again the third day. Even the night Jesus was betrayed, and Peter denied him, he told his disciples, but after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. They clean forgot all that. Even the Old Testament prophesied, Psalm 16 verse 10, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. They did not know the scripture. Beloved, may it never be said of us, for as yet they knew not the scripture. We get taught the word of God Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday. May we never be guilty of not knowing the word of God. Verse 10. And so the disciples, at peace, because John saw, John believed, went away again unto their own home. They return home. But poor Mary, she stays behind at the tomb, still convinced that the body of Jesus had been stolen. Point number three. 
and Mary cries outside the tomb, verse 11. Someone has said, not only did Mary show devotion to Jesus, but she also showed emotion for him as well. Verse 11, but Mary stood without, outside at the sepulcher, weeping. But Mary. The disciples were satisfied, but Mary. The disciples were convinced, but Mary. The disciples had hope, but Mary. And so Mary stays behind at the tomb, the empty tomb, weeping. She is devastated. She is confused. Her heart is broken. She is weeping over an empty tomb. Think of that. What should have been good news was breaking her heart. We would say today that the empty tomb is the greatest proof of the resurrection. And yet Mary is weeping. Oh, how she needed a resurrected Savior. And you know, if I can just interject here, many of us are just like Mary. Mary had all the right facts but she still jumped to the wrong conclusion. And we often do the same thing. Sometimes when we are faced with unbelievable trage tragedy, trials, we often weep and lose hope over the circumstances. When if only we would look at things from God's perspective and trust God's heart, we are wasting our tears. We wouldn't be weeping at all. But in spite of this, I don't want to be harsh on Mary and judge her too harshly, I, we still have to admire her. You know why? Because she loved Jesus in life and she loved him in death. She served him in life and now she meant to serve him even in death. She was there at the tomb alone because not even death could destroy her love for Jesus. But now she makes a move. Verse 11, the second part. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. And then she sees something. Verse 12. She seeth two angels in white, the one sitting at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. She doesn't even get a script to see the angels. And the angels say unto her, Mary looks into the tomb. They speak to her, they ask her a question. Woman, why weepest thou? And she saith unto them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Why are you crying, Mary? And for the second time, she claims wrongly that the body of Jesus had been stolen. But notice the intimacy. This time she says, the body of Jesus. My Lord. Oh. My Lord. When she tells the disciples, she just says, they have taken away the Lord. Now she says, my Lord. Circle that. Verse 14. She, after speaking to the angels, when she had turned thus, when she had thus said, she turned herself back. And who does she see? Jesus standing. And knew not that it was Jesus. From looking into the tomb and talking to the two angels, she turns around and there Jesus is standing. The same one to whom she is so devoted. The same one over whom she is so emotional. The one whom she is seeking so desperately. Yet she does not recognize Jesus. How ironic. People, it's not ironical, eh? It's ironic. Okay? Ironic. How many times don't we complain that we are all alone in our time of need? And yet, so often Jesus is closest to us when we most feel alone. Just because we may not see him or feel his presence does not mean God isn't there. That's why the psalmist said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And then just like the angels did, Jesus questions Mary. Verse 15, Jesus saith unto her, Mary, why weepest thou? And whom seekest thou? Mary, why are you crying and who are you looking for? Now notice Jesus does not ask, what are you looking for? You see, Mary was looking for a what? She was looking for a dead body. She was looking for something. Jesus pointed her to someone. Beloved, the answer to our deepest needs is not in something. It is in someone. Jesus pointed her to someone. And that someone is the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Arama Mary, she jumps to another incorrect conclusion. Why? She assumes that this man, Jesus, is the gardener. And she appeals to him. The Bible says, she, verse 15, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, if you took the body, tell me where thou hast laid him, that I will come and take him away. 
Tell me where you have put my Jesus, and I will come and take him away. No questions asked. I won't even call the police. What devotion. You know, she doesn't even consider for one moment, will I even be, be able to carry the dead weight of Jesus? But now it's time for the big reveal. The big reveal, verse 16. Jesus saith unto her, Mary, Mary. And she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus just had to say one word for Mary to recognize exactly who he is. And that's her name, Mary. He calls her by name. Someone said, never was a one word utterance more charged with emotion than this. Isn't that just like the good shepherd? John 10 verse 3, to him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. Verse 4 says, and when he putteth forth his sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Isaiah 43 verse 1, we did it in the beginning of the year, but now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. Mary recognizes Jesus and she responds with that cry, my teacher. He knows your name. But with this encounter, you see that Jesus confronts Mary. And the next one, with this encounter, it seems as if Mary clung to Jesus, possibly physically embracing Jesus. Maybe she fell at his feet. She clings to him so much so that Jesus has to reprimand her. Look at what he says in verse 17. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Jesus is saying, Mary, don't touch me. Don't cling to me. Don't hold on to me. Why? For I am not yet ascended to my Father. You see, in Mary's mind, she's saying, I have lost Jesus once before at the crucifixion, and I'm going to hang on to Jesus for dear life for fear of losing him again. But you know what Jesus is saying to Mary? Why she can't hold on to him? Listen very carefully. Jesus is saying to her in simple terms, he's saying, Mary, now that I have been resurrected to my new glorified body, things are different now. We have a new relationship that will begin with my ascension. And what happened at the ascension? The Holy Spirit came down. In other words, right now, you see, Mary feels dependent on Jesus' physical presence for her well-being. But Jesus is teaching her that in this new relationship, when he is ascended and seated at the right hand of the Father, we are all equally, everybody assured of Jesus' presence anytime, anywhere, and all the time. So Mary can't have all of Jesus and then there's nothing left for us. We all have equal access to Jesus anytime. And that's why Hebrews 13 verse 5, the second part said, For he hath said, I will never leave thee, never ever, no never, nor forsake thee. You see, even though she may not be physically following Jesus and be with Jesus everywhere he went, Mary would never ever feel abandoned again. And with that, Jesus gives Mary a whole new responsibility. A whole new, he says, go to my brethren. Which brings us to our final point. Jesus, uh, sorry, Mary comes to the disciples and she confesses that Jesus is alive. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples, that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. The Greek here is very vivid. It literally says, Mary came running, telling. She couldn't stop talking about a, a personal and life-threatening encounter with the risen Savior. What has happened? The mourner has become the missionary. From weeper to witness, from grieving to going, from devotion to emotion to promotion. Praise the Lord. What a responsibility Jesus hands to Mary Magdalene, the former demon-possessed woman from Galilee. 
Go and tell the disciples, Mary, that you have seen the Lord and tell them all the things that I have said to you. Wow. Look at the honor that Jesus has bestowed on Mary. She saw two angels. She was the first to see Jesus alive after his death. She was the first to hear his voice and speak to the risen Savior. And she was the first to be sent by Jesus as a witness and with a message. In other words, she was the first evangelist. From mourner at the tomb to missionary from Jesus, for Jesus. From last at the cross to first at the tomb to first to see Jesus and now the first to be a witness for him. And do you know in those days a woman, a court of law would not accept as reliable the testimony of a female witness. You could murder someone in front of a woman and they would not accept her testimony as reliable. But here, what does Jesus do? He takes a woman and he says, you go and testify of what has happened here. But God. He chooses a woman to be a first witness of his resurrection. Finally, and in conclusion, what lessons can we learn from the resurrection through Mary's eyes, from mourner to missionary? What life lessons can we learn from Mary's encounter with Jesus? I've got a few. Number one, never let your past play a part in you coming to Jesus and serving him. Never let your past play a part in you coming to Jesus. Mary came from a life of demon possession, and look what Jesus did for her. Not even the disciples were given the privilege of seeing Jesus first. And so if Jesus could recognize and rescue this poor, insignificant, demon-possessed woman from her life of sin and choose her to be the first witness of his resurrection then surely he can save you from your sin and use you to serve him. No sin is too great and no person is too small for God to use. Okay, number two, great things happen when we seek the risen Savior diligently. Hebrews 11.6, he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. Number three, Great things happen when we seek the risen Savior diligently, personally, and early in the morning. Ian, thank you for reading that verse. Psalm 5 verse 3, My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. Great things happen when you start your day early in the morning. Psalm 8, uh, Proverbs 8 verse 17, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. And number four, when we seek the risen Savior diligently, personally, and honestly, as we are, our sorrow turns to joy. Our sorrow turns to joy. Our, we our weeping turns to wonder. Our sadness turns to satisfaction. Our mourning turns to mirth. Our hopelessness turns to hope. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Having said that, did you notice that most of Mary's tears and weeping and anxiety were unnecessary and actually based on a misunderstanding? She was crying because the tomb was empty, yet the tomb, empty tomb today is our source of greatest joy and assurance. And in the same way, just think about it, in the same way, some of us may be shedding needless tears, some of us may be stressing and worrying unnecessarily, because we fail to see God's plan and his handiwork in place. We fail to trust God and to see that all things, good or bad, always work together for good. We fail to see that while things may seem to be meant for evil, God means it for good. Don't waste tears on unnecessary things. Be anxious for nothing and don't sorrow as if we have no hope. We're number six, my second last one, actually. So when you are feeling down and when you are feeling lost and sad, remember, he knows my name. Hey, he knows my name. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls and he hears me when I call. And Jesus said, Mary, 
Mary knew exactly what was coming. He knows my name. And then finally, beloved, if we have met the risen Savior, maybe not as dramatically as Mary did, then we too are called to do as Mary did, to run and tell all who will listen that we have seen Jesus. We too must be obedient to our Lord's instruction. We too must proclaim like Mary did. I believe Mary came to the disciples and said, I was there, I saw it, I heard it, I experienced it for myself. This is what happened and this is what Jesus has done for me. How dare we sit still with that kind of experience. We should be jumping up and running outside, not going on an Easter egg hunt, but looking for someone to say, I was there, I saw it, I, I know this is what God has done for me. You see, when you have met and when you know the resurrected Savior, we have an, a responsibility to be a witness. So this morning we thank God for the resurrection. And I believe we can thank God for someone like Mary Magdalene, who may have been demon-possessed, but boy, was she possessed of the Lord when Jesus was done with her. Amen? Amen. Thank you for joining us on this blessed Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. May you have a wonderful day. Thank you to those who joined us via our live stream. I wish you a blessed Easter. Let's stand and close in prayer. Please, as Robin mentioned, just for the sake of safety and social distancing and no confusion, please leave through the door where Boshi is. Boshi, make sure no one leaves without leaving the offering there. And then go around, and there's a tape, uh, a boundary tape there. You can't cross it. Just keep right into the parking, and then you may leave. I'd love to greet everyone, but it's going to be impossible. But we need to make place now for our second service. Thank you again for joining us. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you, Lord, for a new perspective that we've seen through the eyes of Mary Magdalene. Thank you for her life. Thank you for these lessons that we could have learned. Oh, Father, again, we say thank you that we serve a risen Savior. He lives, he lives. How do I know he lives? He lives within my heart. Lord, may we live responsibly, and may we live with this new responsibility of sharing the gospel with someone. I pray for someone who is hurting, who has been weeping, who has felt loss without Jesus. Thank you for that assurance that you never leave us nor forsake us, that we never have to be sorrowful. Yes, we may cry, we may feel down, but because we serve a Savior who is sitting at the right hand of the Father, who is in touch with exactly what we are going through. So I pray for those who are grieving this morning, those whose names are on the bulletin and others. The loss is so fresh and painful. But we thank you for God who can comfort, who can strengthen, and who can sustain. Bless you now, Lord. We thank you for our service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.